Good morning, everyone. It is your last final term. You're in the home stretch, and I'm so excited for you guys. The end is near, and there's like a teacher shortage, so it's like the best year ever for you guys to be graduating. It's kind of funny, I always do it because uh, if you're in the after degree program, you actually rarely see me. Um, so my name is Diane Gerlich, and I'm the Associate Dean of the Undergraduate Programs. I usually welcome you and then shake your hand at the end of convocation and kind of run the program behind. Um, before I start, I just want to acknowledge the traditional territories um, of Treaty 7 in Southern Alberta, and Calgary is home to Métis Nation number three. Um, and it's wonderful that we do that, and it's, a, it's an acknowledgement that um, all the schools in Calgary and the province and across Canada are starting to do it. So, um, as you enter your uh, professions and you're entering into assemblies, um, I encourage you just to kind of memorize the, 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 uh, the traditional lands um, and to remember where we start from, right? I am so excited for this week and for this course, uh, Comprehensive School Health and Wellness. It is the first of its kind ever to be offered um, in North America, and we've been checking into our knowledge the first of its kind in this world. So it's really interesting because uh, people across Canada, United States and Europe are watching what's happening in this program. And the question is, why would we make this a mandatory course? Like, why not offer another literacy and normacy course, which is common um, in the United States, it's common across Canada. Why are we saying you're more classroom management, as I always my rant about classroom management. But why this course, right? Why comprehensive school health and wellness? Well, it's really simple. Wellness is a precondition to everything else. Wellness is a precondition to learning and for see feeling safe, for feeling uh, confident in what we do. Because if you don't have that with yourself, or with the schools, or with your students, then nothing can happen. You need the students there and well. And it's interesting because even when I started my profession 26 years ago, I remember the statistic was something like one in three um, beginning teachers leave the profession within three years. And I was one of those statistics, by the way. I went back to graduate school because I said, ah, I can't handle this. I'm in a classroom and there's just so many things we need to change. So I thought, I'll, I'll go bigger. <laughs> I'm going to rule the world, right? But it's interesting, right? Because that statistic is still there. So when we talk to the superintendents from Calgary Catholic and the Calgary Board of Education, and we do meet with them regularly, about three times a year, they said, astronomically, the number of beginning teachers who go on mental stress leave within the first three years has skyrocketed in the last five years. And I thought it was you know, kind of tough when I was in the, in the profession you know, some 20, 20 years ago. And we know the same thing happens with our students. We see it. It's something like one in three, one in four students will have some kind of mental health issue starting at around 10, but there's younger even, it's getting worse, but real, you know, uh, climb, increase by the time they go into adolescence. The complexity of our classrooms is incredible, and you know it, you've been living it and breathing it, and depending where you're placed, I hope you had a positive experience in Field Experience 3, but I think for many of you, you would have seen some of the challenges that students really grapple with. Your children, the ones that you care for in the classrooms, Really, the ones that you can see and you want to help them so, so much. So this is a long time coming, and I do have to acknowledge Shelley Russell Mayhew, who is the leader and the, the person who conceptualized this course, and the advocate, we would call a health champion. And it, you know, when I started this role and it was my associate dean five years ago, she goes, Diane, we have to get to all the student teachers. They're our hope. Because where it's been relegated is phys ed or, or calm or health. And frankly, it tended to be, we, we won't do any health classes, and then we're going to do one week of health just to get our hours in, and then we're done for the rest of the year. Right? Or phys ed, lots of dribbling skills. But not a lot, really, holistically about health. And definitely not, we're not seeing it pervasively integrated in our classrooms. Because we're the ones at the bulk where we see our children, if you're in the, in the main classroom how they're surviving. 
There's an interesting study um, that came out, and I can't recall the, the, the source, but it was, it was, it was, it's sad actually. In high school, one study said about 75% of students in high school never hear their first name said during the course of the week. Not by friends or by teachers. That's kind of shocking. So we need to change it. Something is amiss, right? In terms of the way we think about our, our children, the way in which we support our, our program. So back to this idea. Shelly comes to me about five years ago. Diane, we need to set this up. We need to ensure, not, com not just optional, not just for our phys ed or our health students, but every teacher needs to think about wellness for themselves and for their students and for their schools. And I said, okay, that's great, but you know, we got all these courses and you know, there's, there's, not, there's no flexibility in our program. Like, she's like, I don't care, we have to do this. So for the last four years, we were offering it as a block week like this. Matt, we said expect it, but not a course. And maybe 100 people came. And, oh, and every year, for four years, we had a blizzard on this day. Every single year, this is the first year, I like to thank you guys. There's like, I think it's a good sign that we don't have a blizzard today. And we're like, okay, some people, but they were the ones who were already championing it, the ones who were already advocating. Like, let's make it mandatory. And so we switched it around. Um, and so I love this course. There's so many firsts because it's jointly collaborated with faculty of kinesiology. We've had input from faculty of social work. Some, um, you'll see at the fair um, pe people from nursing. Because what you realize is we, we are not psychologists, we're not therapists, we're not diagnosing, but we need to be the first, we're the eyes and the ears, and we're the pulse, the heartbeat of ensuring that our students get the supports, or knowing where to turn to when our children need the supports. Or how to just create a really fun environment so they enjoy, so that your child is coming out after school going, that was the best day ever, right? And then when you hear your parent, when you're, as a parent, you hear your child going, mom, I loved today. Today was a good day. When we have children saying that at the supper table, as opposed to what was your best time, and they're like, recess. So 10 minutes, excellent, <laughs> you know, 10 minutes. Like, no, tell me, like, tell me a subject, tell me something exciting that happened, recess. Then we're still not there, right? I want them excited about what they're doing. I'm gonna stop, because I know that Shelley has a lot um, to tell you, and I don't wanna take up her entire lecture. I'm gonna give you a challenge. I want you to embrace this week. I have done, over the last four years, different versions of this, and I'm gonna pop in and out over the next three days where I can. I want you to embrace the activities, have fun. There's energizers. I have, I have been sore the next day <laughs> in terms of all the different activities, but I want you to think about it. So embrace the activities this week. The second one is I want you to truly to think about what, at least one thing that you're gonna do to integrate it into your teaching practices when you go into your final practicum. I know your assignment is also to think what change could you make in the school, right? And that's, a, and that's an honest, true challenge to you. Not just an assignment to get the grade, but what truly could you do given you the context of the school that you've been working in, what's one thing you could do to make it a slight change better, okay? I wish you so much wellness over the next time. Good luck this next month. It's, you know, I know that everyone's writing resumes. Everyone is applying for jobs. I hope you had a little bit of a break because it's intense when you did your field experience and this month is intense. Get rest, be well, eat healthy. Try to ask for favors from your friends and family to make you a home cooked meal so that you're not running ragged. Good luck in February from all your field, and I will see you in June when I call your name out um, at convocation. But I wish you so much success, and I, I can hardly wait to be, for you to be part of the profession and as a colleague to me. So thank you so much for coming, and I'm going to pass it over to Shelley. I'm Dr. Shelley Russell Mayhew, and I'm course coordinator for this uh, 
for this course, Comprehensive School Health and Wellness. And as I look out today, this is literally and figuratively a dream come true for me. It's hard for me not to get emotional because I've dreamed of this day for well over eight years. And I've worked with literally hundreds of people to put, put together this course uh, for you, the very first course for sure in Canada in comprehensive school health for Bachelor of Education students. And so just looking out here to see that all of you as teachers are going to be able to influence all of these students in schools and I'm just imagining the change that we can create in the world and it, 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 uh, I'm just really excited about it. So it does take a village. So I get to stand up here and give you the plenary lecture and tell you all about the history of us coming up with this course and talk to you about some of the main concepts that we'll be covering in the course. But really there's been a core committee of people probably about 20 or so people over the years that have worked together tirelessly to create what we think is cutting edge groundbreaking content uh, and processes for you to take up over the next three days and then in the five weeks following. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the process of how the course came together uh, in a bit. But what I first want to do is explore some of the main concepts that um, will create a foundation for the work that we're doing together in the next uh, three days. So let's start with the most basic level here. So where do you get your health information from? How do you know what health is? What kind of health messages are you exposed to on a daily basis? How do you define health? So that question might seem kind of simple, but we're bombarded with messages about health on a daily basis. So I just want to give you an example of that. So these are headlines. We're exposed to these kind of headlines on a daily basis, social media. Uh, we see these kinds of things. Okay, so no one is immune to the messages that we get about health. Uh, although I, I'm guessing that some of the snickering would indicate that you're questioning some of the scientific validity of some of the headlines, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so now that we see the kind of messages we're exposed to, what I'd like to do is really talk about what health is. And so let's have a look at a couple of frameworks that I think are going to help us answer this most fundamental question. What is health? So let's uh, listen to Jack's story. How do we define health? Well, according to the World Health Organization, the term refers to a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. Many economic and social factors influence our health, and are often overlooked. These factors are known as the social determinants of health, which can have a large impact on one's quality of life. Income is a major determinant of health. Our level of income directly impacts daily living conditions such as access to education and health services, food security, housing, transportation, and social inclusion. According to the Minnesota Department of Health, social and economic factors are the number one determinant of an individual's health. To better understand the impact of economic factors on quality of life, let's take a quick look at the life of our friend Jack. Jack is a 27-year-old single parent who works a physically demanding job in a local factory. He makes minimum wage working overnight shifts while his son stays with his grandparents. A problem with Jack's job is that because he doesn't have any specialized qualifications, any average Joe could fill his position and complete the same work. This was the only job Jack could get as he doesn't have any post-secondary education. Jack makes $10.50 an hour bringing home roughly $1,600 a month before taxes. After paying for rent, utilities, and low quality food, there is very little money left at the end of the month. Jack does not have the money for him and his child to participate in extracurricular activities such as sports, nor can he afford the cost of transportation. With little job security, he is always worried about the fact that he could end up having no way to care for himself and his child. Like Jack, many Canadians are facing a similar reality due to their level of income. A 2011 study suggested that one in seven Canadians is living in poverty. However, these difficulties are often overlooked by individuals of higher socioeconomic status not facing similar living conditions. Minimum wage jobs are often associated with high physical demands and little job security. They don't offer benefits such as health and dental insurance, which influence someone's ability to access health services. One in ten Canadians cannot afford to fill their medical prescriptions. 
Canada is the only industrialized country in the world with a universal healthcare system, but without a national pharmacare policy. Another issue that Jack faces is food insecurity. Food insecurity is considered the inability to acquire an adequate diet in terms of quality and quantity in a socially acceptable manner. Jack's income lacks financial stability and he fails to provide a healthy diet resulting in malnutrition. It has been said that one in eight Canadian households struggle to put food on the table. These food insecurities can create health implications such as diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure. They can also impact an individual's psychological well-being. Housing is another social determinant that affects Jack's health. There is a direct relationship between inadequate housing and adverse health outcomes. When discussing housing as a social determinant of health, it is important to emphasize the quality of housing which is available. To do this, we must examine the physical, social, and environmental living conditions. The physical condition of a home includes plumbing, electricity, safe drinking water, heating, and exposure to physical, biological, and chemical contaminants such as pests, allergens, or mold. There is an increased risk of respiratory illness for both children and adults in damp and moldy houses compared to those living in dry conditions. In turn, this can lead to poor health. The social and environmental conditions of housing are also important aspects affecting one's health. When considering the environmental conditions surrounding an individual's home, it is important to consider the proximity to services such as school, health services, grocery stores, and recreational areas, all of which have a direct effect on our health. Like Jack, many Canadians struggle to pay for these adequate housing services and often have to face the dilemma of whether to use their available income to pay for rent or to put food on the table. An individual's health is influenced by a variety of factors. Gender, race, presence of disabilities, and transportation all further contribute to the vicious cycle existing with regard to social inequalities. And considering our friend Jack and his son, living in such conditions will impact their ability to overcome obstacles related to the social determinants of health. So that's Jack's story. Health is not something that just exists within us. The social determinants of health, in fact, have been shown to be the number one determinant of somebody's health. So here are a number of the social determinants of health that were talked about in the video. Now, did any of the headlines that we saw consider the social determinants of health? We're not really exposed to this concept a whole lot in the headlines because people like to blame individuals for their health status. It's much more complex uh, and much more accurate to consider the social determinants of health when we're looking at uh, what, what is health. So let's consider Jack's son Jason because Jack's son Jason is actually in your class. So why is Jason in the hospital? Well, because he ha had a bad infection in his leg. But why does he have an infection? Because he has a cut on his leg and it got infected. Well, why does he have a cut on his leg? because he was playing in a junkyard next to his apartment and there was some sharp jagged steel there and he fell on it. Yeah, but why was he playing in a junkyard? Because his neighborhood is kind of run down and a lot of kids play there and there's no one to supervise them. But why does he live in that neighborhood? Well, because his dad can't afford a nicer place to live. Well, why can't Jack afford a nicer place to live? Well, because his dad has a low paying job and his mom is sick. But why is his dad unemployed? Well, because he doesn't have a lot of education and he can't find a job, or at least a job that any average Joe couldn't do. Well, why can't he, right? We can, we, we can carry on with that story for a very long time. So improving the health of our students, attending to the health and wellness of our students, requires that we think about health and its social determinants in a more sophisticated manner than has been done to date. As teachers, we never really know what's going on in the lives of the children that we teach. We live in complex times, and so do the students whose lives we will touch. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit more deeply. So we want to consider the social determinants of health in answer to our question, what is health? I think there's another framework we might want to consider as well. So, if health is more than the absence of disease, and if health is also partly about the social determinants of health, what are its components? 
Now, to look at the components, we turn to the term wellness, which is often used interchangeably with the word health. And we know that there are a number of frameworks for wellness. We're going to look at seven components of wellness today. So physical. So this is related to moving, sleeping, eating, preventing injury and illness. When we think of health, physical is usually the first thing that people think of in terms of what is health, what is wellness. Well, it's our physical bodies. But it is also much more than that. It's also emotional. So to express emotions appropriately, uh, having feelings of self-confidence, trust, love. It's also social. To have good interpersonal relationships strongly impacts our health. It's also intellectual. The ability to learn, to grow, to develop, to become the best version of ourselves. It's also spiritual. So this isn't just about religion, the, although it could be. Um, it's a belief in a higher power, a feeling of unity with others, a sense of belonging, living life in line with your values. Occupational is another component. So creating a vision for your career, being adaptive, learning new skills, and it's also environmental. So the effect of, of the environmental conditions. Um, so for example, minimizing junk mail <laughs> at your house is an environmental. So the term wellness has been applied in many ways. Although there might be different views on what the wellness components are, what's most important is that we, we know that health and wellness is more than the absence of disease, and we also more, know that it's more than just about our physical bodies, our physical beings. Now you will see in this model that there's an eighth dimension that they've added here, um, and that is, I think, financial they've added, yes. So they've also, in addition to the seven we just covered, they've also uh, added financial wellness. Now, regardless of which framework you use, there's general agreement that wellness is conscious, it's self-directed, it's self-evolving, uh, it's multidimensional, uh, it's holistic, uh, it's positive, and it's affirming. So wellness is an active process through which people become aware of and make choices to, towards a more successful self. So really the fundamental question that we are asking you to address as future teachers, as people who will t literally touch the lives of hundreds and hundreds of students, <laughs> The question that we're asking you to address in this course is, how will you as teachers attend to your own wellness and attend to the wellness of your students? How will you as future teachers attend to your own wellness and attend to the wellness of your students? So those are a couple of frameworks that I'd like you to sort of carry with you in the back of your mind for the next few days, the social determinants of health and the dimensions of wellness. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about um, how this course came to be. So we ho hope that this course will help you make some informed decisions about that question, about how you will attend to health and wellness for yourself and for your students. I want to tell you a little bit about the course, in part because this is a dream come true for me and I get to actually talk to you about how long I've been having this dream. So we, the Workland School of Education partnered with the Faculty of Kinesiology and with Ever Active Schools. And for the last nine years, we have been working together on finding a way to make health and wellness education a mandatory part of the curriculum for all Bachelor of Education students in the Workland School of Education because we believe that health and wellness is actually fundamental to the success of teachers and we actually have a lot of research evidence to indicate that the health and wellness of students is actually fundamental to their academic success. So I'm pretty excited to be here. This has been a labor of love over the last eight or nine years. Um, the content and process, the delivery of this course uh, has been something that we have given a lot of thought to. So this course is happening in a different way than other courses that you have um, taken in uh, our undergraduate program. So we have block week for three days here, and then we have five weeks of courses, uh, five weeks uh, of lecture and lab after that. 
So there's an hour and 15 minute lecture and then a three hour lab where you're divided into your sections with your instructor. So your lab instructors um, at 1030 over in the kinesiology building are going to go over the course outline with you in a, in a really detailed kind of way. What I want to do here is just sort of provide you a foundation of some of the thought that has gone into how this course has been designed and the type of things that you'll be exposed to in the course. But first I want to tell you just a little bit more about myself, about why this is something that I would be so passionate about that to spend nine years of my life trying to make happen. So I came to this notion of comprehensive school health, which we're going to talk about a lot, because that's the title of the course, Comprehensive School Health and Wellness, yeah? So I came to this concept a little bit differently, I think, than most other people do. So uh, my research program is about weight-related issues. So I study eating disorders and obesity and body image and weight bias. And about half of my research program takes place in school contexts. So I'm consulted, I'm called, I don't know, a hundred times a year from various schools that ask me questions, yeah, this is happening in my school, I'm not sure why I feel uncomfortable about it, should this really be happening? So I'm oftentimes the person that people end up finding to talk about weight-related issues in schools. So at the same time as I'm getting these phone calls and consultations about policies and practices that are happening in educational settings, comprehensive school health as a framework is, is taking off as a evidence-informed, nationally recognized framework to address health-related issues in schools. So it became clear to me that none of the issues that we see happening in schools take place in a vacuum. And what we do to address, appropriately address, weight-related issues in schools is probably not all that different than from what we need to do to address the other, other kinds of issues that we see surfacing in schools. And if we have a health-promoting approach, if we look at the risk and protective factors, um, we can address a lot of things by creating a context and a community that um, encourages health and wellness of all the people in the community, the students and the teachers. And then it became clear to me that it's really not enough for us as a Workland School of Education to be talking about how health and wellness needs to take place in K-12 schools. We also need to be living that in our faculty. So there are a number of approaches that we took. So there was recognition about health and wellness in schools and I was receiving all sorts of phone calls for consultations about weight practices. So I, was, I wondered where I should start, where should I start with this information. So I started with some pilot funding to look at Bachelor of Education curriculum. So what are B.Ed. students across Canada learning about health and wellness? What are they learning about weight or weight bias or weight related issues? So we discovered by doing a document review of 880 course descriptions across Canada that weight is not examined at all. Teachers aren't learning anything about weight and incidentally they're learning very little or nothing about health and wellness. So teachers are coming into schools with the knowledge they get from the headlines that we saw, right? And the knowledge from social media, from their own doctors, from their own families, and in some cases, this information that they're bringing about health is actually not going that well in schools. Otherwise, I wouldn't be getting all the consultations. And also, you saw that what's reported in the headlines is very rarely accurate science. Even, it's, even if it's based on a study, the results of the study have been misinterpreted for the headline. In addition, if you look at the health and physical education curriculums across Canada, what you'll find is that there are wellness components that teachers are expected to address in schools. So teachers have this expectation as part of their role when they get into schools, but they're not exposed to any training at all about physical literacy, health literacy, mental health literacy in their B.Ed. programs. So there's a fundamental gap between training and practice. So that became clear through this uh, pilot research. So then I thought, well, maybe that's not a problem. But what I discovered is that in a project that we looked at a previous cohort, 226 pre-service teachers, we looked at their beliefs and behaviors around health and weight. And what we discovered is that 
teachers themselves are struggling with some of the very issues that need to be attended to in schools. So I'm not picking on teachers. Lots of professionals have these same concerns going on. We all live in a complex world. And no one is immune to the discourses. It's just that I believe that teachers have an enormous potential to influence positively or negatively the children that they come in touch with through their profession. So if teachers have some of their own issues and concerns around health and wellness and weight and get little to no education around health and wellness, what are we teaching and what is happening in schools? So we recognized this gap and over the years uh, we uh, did some pilot projects which we called Health Champions. So Health Champions started off as a, uh, I think we've done four of them, I think this might be the fifth. So um, during block week we would invite Bachelor of Education students to attend um, a two-day conference where we would invite community partners to do lectures, where we would do some experiential kinds of activities in the gyms, where we would have a resource fair, and we collected data about this um, over time. Now essentially all the pilot data that we've collected from this type of training indicates that the two days actually made a difference in terms of the health and wellness attitudes of the teachers, the pre-service teachers who self-selected to come to the program. Now I just have to show, <laughs> through my research, that when we train teachers in such a way, like through this course, that we can actually impact the health and wellness of students. So this is the next step in my research program, is that I'm hoping that we can actually show a direct impact, that when teachers are trained in health and wellness, that impacts the health and wellness of their students. Now, um, as a reminder, if you're passionate about this as well, there are ways you can help us explore some of these research questions, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, a voluntary research opportunity that's part of this course towards the end of my lecture. So a core committee and I developed some content for professional development or for professional learning which has changed and expanded over time. So it really started out as a three-hour lecture where I talked about weight in schools, but since then it has evolved into a two-day health champions conference that's much more framed around the comprehensive school health approach where we talk about different pillars and approaches to health. And now we have a whole course outline that's dedicated to these issues, so this is really exciting. As part of our Health Champions conferences over the last uh, four years, the number one identified best part of the whole two days, according to the evaluation forms that we did with all of the people who participated, was the resource fair, which will take place for you guys on Friday morning. And here we have about 25 community partners that come to the gym, that set up tables, that have resources available for teachers in schools that take up some of the issues related to health and wellness. And you get to have a tour of that and collect these resources for yourselves for your teaching practice. So our studies show that after the Professional Development Health Champions Workshop, which was just two days, you guys get three days plus the five weeks of the course, um, that what we actually show is a significant decrease in weight bias, um, which we measured using various scales, and more importantly, I think, an increased confidence or an increased sense of self-efficacy to address health issues in schools. So these are some quotes from some of your colleagues who have taken the Health Champions Conference before you. So these were some of the qualitative indices that have been collected from students is what they had to say about their learning. So why an entire course on comprehensive school health and wellness? The simplest answer to that is that we know that healthy students are better learners. There's lots of evidence to suggest that if your students are healthy and well, they will learn better. So children who are sick or hungry or tired tend not to learn as well. And there's all kinds of research to show that cognition, concentration, and cooperation are enhanced when students feel healthier. And schools can be an ideal place for children to learn healthy habits, um, and it can benefit them all of their lives. But when you're in the business of teaching, reading, writing, arithmetic, 
and are already stretched in terms of your capacity as, as a teacher, calling for an increased emphasis on health in schools can feel like an add-on. But the whole point of this course is to find ways for this to be a much more integrative, it's a way of being, not necessarily a thing you have to additionally do. Research in comprehensive school health has proved over and over again that it's quite short-sighted to think that the health of your students will not impact their learning. Education and health are very interdependent, and studies worldwide have demonstrated that the health of students, as well as the health of teachers, as well as the environment in which they operate, impact academic performance, teacher morale, and absenteeism. So what exactly is comprehensive school health? Comprehensive school health in a nutshell. So many of you who are watching this have probably never heard of comprehensive school health or seen this acronym before. Well, that's about to change because I'm going to spend the next few minutes introducing you to comprehensive school health. And I'm going to try to keep it simple, I promise. Comprehensive School Health is an internationally recognized framework to build healthy schools, endorsed by the World Health Organization. The framework has four interrelated pillars. These are basically areas of focus. They include teaching and learning, social and physical environment, healthy school policy, and partnerships and services. This framework and the whole concept of healthy schools is based on research that shows health and education are interdependent. In simple terms, healthy students are better learners, and better educated students are healthier. Research also shows that using a holistic approach, that's the comprehensive part, has a greater impact than using a single approach. Basically, this means taking action in all four pillars. And when schools take coordinated action in all four of these pillars, the pieces start to fit together, like these puzzle pieces and students are supported to realize their full potential as learners and as healthy individuals in their communities. When first learning about comprehensive school health, you may be tempted to think this approach is too much work. But this approach isn't about doing more work. It's a new way of working that will become everyday practice. And creating a healthy school will have many benefits for the entire school community. Well, I hope we've piqued your interest. If so, please visit www.healthyschoolsbc.ca to learn more about healthy schools and comprehensive school health. Okay, so comprehensive school health is a framework that we're using um, to sort of structure the course, and it's a framework that really incorporates a lot of the other frameworks that we've taken up, like the dimensions of wellness and the social determinants of health. So there are three priority areas in comprehensive school health. These are healthy eating, physical activity, and positive mental well-being. So this afternoon, you will notice that you have a session in each of these three areas to attend. Okay, so we're going to give you some foundations in the three areas of comprehensive school health this afternoon. The components of comprehensive school health, really, or the how, how do we do comprehensive school health, are social physical environments, teaching and learning, partnerships and services, and healthy school policy. So this really helps us, a comprehensive school health framework actually just helps us take a step back and look at the whole ecosystem of the school. Because we want to identify health as more than something that just takes place within the individual student. It's actually much more sophisticated than that. So, uh, comprehensive school health suggests a range of influences from the personal characteristics to the broad social determinants of health that shape students behaviors and attitudes. It means that every student, in fact every human being, is influenced by a unique set of opportunities and a unique set of barriers that's shaped by a complex interaction of biological, social, and environmental factors. Now comprehensive school health approach seeks to nurture a variety of protective factors in the school that help build resilient students and teachers and parents, people that are able to bounce back from adversity. So comprehensive school health programs don't focus simply on fixing students. Rather, a comprehensive school health approach 
uh, changes the school environment so that it allows students to be in an environment that they can reach their full, poten full potential and helps to engage students in a learning process. So for instance, rather than relying on let's say one program that comes into the school to address whatever issue, like let's say a drug prevention program or an alcohol prevention program, rather than parachute that program into the school and have someone do a lecture for 45 minutes and then leave the school, what we're actually trying to do in the school is create some foundations of health in that school that allow students to make better choices, to make healthy choices, that acknowledge the social determinants of health, that acknowledge that wellness has multiple dimensions to it. So the development of the course you're receiving now, we have actually used a comprehensive school health framework to try to impact our faculty of education. So we actually used a health promoting schools, comprehensive school health approach in the development of this course so that really what we're trying to do is practice what we preach. Okay, so for example, teaching and learning is one of the pillars. So what we've done with teaching and learning in this course is we've tried to use innovative teaching methods where you're going to do some kinesthetic learning in the gyms, where we have community engaged learning because we have all these partners coming in to do presentations, to do community resource fair. In terms of social and physical environments, in this course we're, we're inviting you to focus on your own health and wellness because we know that that impacts your relationship with your students. Um, and we're also asking you to focus on your preparedness to address health and wellness in schools. Partnerships and services. So as I've mentioned, this course takes a village. There are literally hundreds of people involved in the delivery of this course for you over the next three days and the following five weeks. Literally hundreds of people. Hundreds of heads have been put together to make this the best possible uh, experience for you. So we have faculty members, we have sessionals, we have graduate students, we have campus and community partners like Everactive Schools and Alberta Health Services and boards of education that have consulted on this course. And finally, healthy school policy. So this course is now a mandatory part of BEAD curriculum. The very first mandatory part, um, mandatory course in Canada on comprehensive school health. But it also brought about changes to our academic plan. So this course was part of an impetus for looking at how can we as academics be preaching to our students about health and wellness without actually practicing some of these things ourselves. So you'll see in our new academic plan that health and wellness is actually one of the four strategic pillars that we have in the academic plan. We're actually f focusing on that um, because if we're stating claim that your health affects your students, well then our health affects you, right? If the school environment that you teach in affects your health and your students, then the environment of the Workland School of Education also affects you. So we have to practice what we preach. And in the development of this course, we followed a comprehensive school health plan uh, to make this course come to life. So these are the learning outcomes that you'll see on your course outline. I'm not gonna read them all, but what I will tell you is that to come up with these five, because there were probably 25 that we could have done, is we consulted with over 40 community partners um, about the development of this course. And one of the things that we asked them, so we included um, people from Alberta Education, people from Alberta Learning, superintendents, uh, in teachers that were already teaching, experts in comprehensive school health, government officials, principals, teachers, the ATA. So we had all of these community partners come to consult on. We asked them the question, if you, what are the three main things? You have 300 Bachelor of Education students. <laughs> what are the three main messages that you would want them to leave with? And we gathered that data, and as a result of that data, these are now the five objectives of the course. This is what we hope that you will leave with. One of the most important things that we heard from our community partners our, from this consultation and how we continue to hear is that comprehensive school health shouldn't just be this sort of theoretical thing. It should be something that 
teachers know how to apply. And so you'll notice that there's a strong emphasis in this course on practical, hands-on, applied knowledge. This is something that you will be able to use in your um, field for. And the assignments are made, are designed such that you could use some of your assignments in field four. Because um, the hiring of teachers over time, so <laughs> one of the things we also hear from our community partners is that in interviews, they're beginning to ask more about comprehensive school health. In fact, it's one of the questions that you can probably expect in your interview certainly for the CBE and probably for some of the other school boards that you'll be interviewing for, they will ask you about your experience with and your knowledge of comprehensive school health. So the people we consulted with are the people that are responsible for hiring teachers. And as we train teachers to understand comprehensive school and health and wellness, we have the opportunity to change the culture of schools over time, which is really exciting. So we're really committed to the health and wellness of schools and the whole school community. In fact, in the framework for K-12 wellness education from Alberta Education, one of the barriers consistently identified in terms of implementing quality wellness programming and education is the lack of pre-service training and professional development. So we are actually changing history here today because we can no longer claim that that will be a barrier, at least when you go for your interviews and when you go to your schools. So why as future teachers should you consider health and wellness of your school environments? Well, we know a lot of things are happening. We know that this may be the first generation of children and youth to lead shorter lives than their parents. We know that the average five to, seven, five to 17 year old Canadian child spends an average of 8.5 hours a day looking at a screen. 31% of school age kids are sleep deprived and 36% of 14 to 17 year olds find it difficult to stay awake during the day. Violence, substance abuse and other disruptive behaviors are all linked to students values, character and academic performance. We know that between 10 and 20% of Canadian youth will develop a mental health concern. But it's not just about the mental health or the health and well-being of K-12 students. So the University of Calgary Mental Health Strategy reflects the importance of health on our students, on the undergraduate and graduate students in our campus, on our campus. So the Mental Health Strategy Report in 2015 noted that the majority of students expressed feeling overwhelmed in fact, 90% of students expressed feeling overwhelmed, 64% expre expressed feel feeling lonely, 58 very anxious, and 67 very sad at some point during that year. We know that comprehensive school health works, and we know that healthy students make better learners, so it's not too much of a stretch to suggest that healthy teachers make better teachers. And we know that healthy teachers can create healthier school communities. So the final framework I want to have a quick look at is the Alberta Framework for K-12 Wellness Education, which endorses comprehensive school health approaches. So we're going to look at the framework from Alberta, how Alberta Education defines it. Those are the first four bullets. Second, we'll look at some of the content pieces in the framework, just really briefly. And then third, we're going to look just briefly at the process. So this is the definition from the K-12 wellness education framework. Wellness is a balanced state of emotional, intellectual, physical, social, and spiritual well-being that enables students to reach their full potential in the school community. Personal wellness occurs with commitment to lifestyle choices based on healthy attitudes and actions. So this is a great definition. Based on what we talked about today, does anyone see anything missing from this definition? Yay, social determinants of health. Yes, yeah, so we could critique this to say that the social determinants of health is not present in this particular definition. So let's look at some of the other content pieces. So what is physical liter literacy? Having the motivation, confidence, physical competence, knowledge and understanding to value and take responsibility for engagement in physical activities for life. Now you'll notice that this is very similar to one of the three main components of comprehensive school health, which is called physical activity. 
Health literacy, the ability to access, comprehend, evaluate, and communicate information. So health literacy is equally as important for teachers as it is for students. Teachers get to decide what resources come into the classroom uh, as a way to promote, maintain, and improve health in a variety of settings. So you will notice, or one could argue, that there's a crossover here with comprehensive school health and well, uh, as well. Uh, certainly healthy eating would be part of health literacy. And finally, social-emotional learning is another foundation that the Alberta Education recognizes. The framework outlines social-emotional learning, which is a fundamental part of positive mental well-being, which is the last priority identified by comprehensive school health. So here's the Alberta framework for K-12 wellness education. So it illustrates the key el elements. Health and physical education programs of study, which you'll see in the green circle, uh, which includes a focus on K-9 to health and lifestyle skills, physical health and education. You'll notice that there's health and wellness dimensions integrated across all subject areas and wellness related courses that offer particular opportunities to gain more in-depth knowledge. But what is in the center of this diagram? Yeah, the whole child. I think that's pretty important. What surrounds this diagram? The components of wellness. Now again, we might critique this and add a few more components of wellness. The Alberta framework uses five, great. At least we know that we're defining wellness as more than the absence of disease, and we know that it's more than just physical wellness. Again, what might we critique this diagram for or about what it's missing? Thank you, social determinants of health. Alberta Education's ministerial order on student learning talks about uh, a competency model. So a healthy school community uh, creates the competencies for teachers and for students. So you'll notice here, here are the cross-curricular competencies, which will be the topic of discussion Friday afternoon in your labs. And you will notice that one of the cross-curricular competencies is personal growth and well-being. Not to mention that the, a competency identified as important, it's across all subject areas, yes? So let's just see this come to life a little bit, how we link wellness and learning. There's nothing that happens in schools outside of the classroom and some things included in the classroom that don't help to connect kids to schools. Comprehensive school health helps kids to connect to schools, be healthy when they approach their education, make better decisions, which is going to make them better students, better graduates, and better citizens going forward. has an impact on how students will be engaged in front of us in the, in the classroom, uh, their productivity, uh, their outcomes, their, their results that they achieve, the products that they produce are all related. They, they come in, they're lost. They don't know where they where they're going or what they're doing. So uh, they need some direction here. So they come here to to uh, uh, build a connection with with their teachers, with the people that are positive. I think it helps you focus on your schoolwork more. School health, as I understand it. it, it makes sense for us because we're tapping into resources that are in the community. We're tapping into resources that are already in existence. It's just a matter of, of making sure our schools and all the people in the schools are aware that those resources are there. But um, but it's more than that, of course. I mean, it's a whole approach to how we can make our schools healthier and more um, available for kids to be learning because that's what it's all that's what we're all about is making sure that. Our kids have every opportunity to be to learn. The link between health and learning is there because you can't really improve the learning outcomes without addressing the health issues. Gone from being something that's a 
add-on to what we were already doing, to being the mothership that guides all of the different things that happen in the school because they're all wellness. There's an abundance of research now that tells us and informs us that student learning and academic success are really contingent on healthy students in a healthy environment and that we would be ignoring those variables at our peril. Okay, so you'll notice that that video was produced by one of the organizations that is your required reading for the next three days, the, the Wellness Fund. Um, so again, that's just kind of, those are people from schools who've implemented comprehensive school health and we had the student voice, principal voice, teacher voice, counselor voice in there. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is some research attached to this course because it's the first time we've delivered it in this way. So I'm the principal investigator on the research that's taking place uh, as part of this course. And uh, your voice can be influ influential in shaping the future delivery of this course uh, through participating in the research. Now, we've made this um, as easy as possible for you. So there are a number of ways to opt into the research. Uh, the research will in no way impact um, your experience in the course. Uh, but for example, one of the things that we would like is we would like permission to use one of your assignments for research purposes. So that would simply require you to fill out the consent form and then send your already done assignment uh, to a particular email address for us to use for research purposes. So it can be as simple as that. There are additional opportunities. We're inviting people to focus groups if they would like to have a chat about their experience in the course and maybe how they were able to implement it or not in field four. So you would be invited to come to a focus group. And we also have an additional opportunity where we're asking for some written feedback from you about um, the course content, how the course content helped or not in your uh, field placement, that kind of thing. As principal investigator, I will not know who's participating in the research or not. Your instructor will not know who's participating in the research or not. And it will in no way impact your experience in the course or your grade in the course. But as principal investigator, I would certainly welcome your feedback so that we can continue to improve this course in multiple ways. And also I need to say that the research is approved by the Conjoint Faculties Research Ethics Board. I get to stand up here and present the history of the development of this course, but really this is the work of a core committee of people who have been working tirelessly over eight or nine years um, to arrive at this place we are this morning. So there's been well over 1,200 hours of in-kind work from uh, community organizations plus our community partners, uh, many organizations represented here today in various places. So I want to acknowledge Tina Gabriel from Faculty of Kinesiology, Gavin Peet, My Body Image Research Lab, specifically Alana Ireland and Michelle Kachuk, I can never say her last name, uh, Joyce Sonata from Everactive Schools, Austri Kendrick, Angela Alberga, Angela Grace. You will notice that a lot of the names you're hearing are actually the names of your instructors for your labs. So uh, your lab instructors are coming with applied and particular expertise and we're really lucky to have a, the group of uh, instructors we have for our labs. Also a shout out to uh, Emily Williams, Laura Blakey and Victoria Nebraska who are the current uh, RAs on the research associated with this course. <laughs>